What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bear, and through the Zoom cyberspace universe is Tori McElhaney and Ashton Edmonds. We're all back in the ATL at this point, coming to you after a 19-13 to 13 loss to the Washington Commanders. If you saw this game live or heard it on the radio, it didn't end well for the Falcons. It nearly did, um, and then did <laughs> Uh, courtesy of an interception that was batted and then caught by the wrong team when the Falcons are at the four yard line, uh, killing a comeback that had so much promise that would have put them in. Yeah, we'll just say it in first place in the NFC South because Tampa Bay lost in overtime. The Falcons were not able to take advantage and pick up a game on the, on their rivals from Tampa Bay. Ultimately they end up losing a close one a difficult one, a one that they're going to have to get over pretty quickly because no matter how much we'd like to say, and I tried to write in my column that, hey, man, we don't use the playoffs word around here anymore until they start stacking wins. The Bucks just keep that division compact. So they really uh, do. They and, really make uh, it difficult on all of us. They really do. <laughs> they everybody, really do. All, everybody in the NFC South is just like, let's just make this hard on everyone else. Hard yeah. on everybody. And it's not like the Saints want to make up ground. They, uh, they lost to the 49ers. <laughs> and, I mean, they had a golden opportunity to move they into did. second place today. And we're like, nah, we're not into it. No way. <laughs> hard pass. <laughs> uh, so, nonetheless, um, I normally say overall takeaways – how about this? One of you go from the game. Tori, go from the game. Ashton, go with your takeaway on the state of the NFC South. Tori, go first. Yeah, take of the game was that the Falcons, again, I felt like lost a game that they had every opportunity to win. Uh, it's really interesting because when you look at the last, you know, the Falcons have played 12 games this year. And I believe 10 of the 12 have been decided by the final like drive of the game or the and final nine, minute. Yeah and, yeah. and nine as one score games, but yes, yes. 10 decided at the end. Yes. So because of that, it's, it, it's like the Falcons, it almost feels very like frustrating and no one can see me, but I'm literally just like running my head, like my hands, like on my forehead. I feel like I have a headache from this game because it, it was another game in which the Falcons had an opportunity to win and couldn't finish it out. And I think something that I feel like keeps coming up is the Falcons don't have an issue holding on to a lead this year. It's fighting from behind that I think has been hard wins have been hard to come by in that sense. So that was kind of my major, major takeaway. I'm sure we're going to get into all of the nitty gritty stuff. Um, but that was it just kind of big picture looking at the game itself. That was kind of what I took from it. Yeah. And I would say looking at the NFC South as a whole, it's, it's weird because no team is over 500. You know, the Bucks are five and six, we're five and seven and the Panthers and Saints are both four and eight. So it's like this, I would say this um, conference or this division specifically has, has definitely fluctuated a lot. Um, the Falcons definitely have to win against Tampa Bay and the Saints, you know, moving forward in these last five games. Um, it's, it's very vital. It's crucial, um, especially if they do want to have a playoff spot. But, you know, it's I, I it's I guess Tampa Bay losing today was good for the Falcons. But the Falcons aren't if we are not they're not playing like a playoff team and they have they have to win these last five games um, to be considered like a, a real playoff team contender. Yeah, I, Ashton's right with a very accurate and kind of, you know, tough point, right? In that they're not playing like a playoff team right now. Tyler Algier, who's, I don't know, I mean, he's barely old enough to drink, really had a <laughs> meeting with the media that I thought was, uh, showed a lot of maturity. Yeah. Really wise when, and the crux of what he started in saying is that good teams keep it close, great teams finish. That's true. And sometimes, uh, you know, and the Falcons have kept it close time and time again. We talked about so many of these one score games. They've they've played 12 again. Nine have ended uh, with one score difference between the winner and the loser. They are now four and five in those games. Last year, they were seven and two. The close game efficiency or um, 
success doesn't often travel from one year to the next. There's so much randomness in there. There's not luck, but there's a lot of uh, very minute and small margin for error between a win and a loss in those scenarios. But ultimately, when you look at it, they're not coming up clutch more like often enough. And I think it goes back to Tori's point. If you look at so many of the games where they lost by one score, it was against Tampa, fell by uh, fell behind big. It was the LA Rams, uh, they fell behind big. And then um, and then in this game, it like it was really pretty close. The Chargers, they jumped out to a lead and lost it. The Saints, they jumped out to a lead and lost it, but ultimately not coming out of these close games at a, at a high enough clip is, is costing them here. And this was one of those games. It was a low scoring game. And uh, I still think that we should go ahead and um, sell the audio to the Scott and Tori. Um, it's not really complain a fest, but it's definitely like <laughs> ongoing and unfiltered uh, narrative of what's happening in the game. And there was yeah. a point where I forget which one of us said it, but essentially they were down three and then down six in the second half. And it kind of felt like they were down by 18, yeah. right? Because they just were giving up, uh, as Grady Jarrett put it, leaky run plays, plun, uh, uh, run plays that, that were stopped early, but gained more. And ultimately Washington churned out a couple more points and a couple more points, but then all of a sudden the defense gets two big stops and it comes down to that final drive. So Enough of my filibustering, Tori. Let's get into this final drive. It yeah. looked so good for so long until it didn't. Yeah. I sorry. I just did like the biggest right. sigh. I was, yeah. <laughs> you probably thought I was going to keep talking. I'm like, no. <laughs> I no. Was, I feel like that sigh really uh, encapsulates how I felt about that drive because it was, and this was something I wrote about post game. Is it was, it was the could have, would have, should have drive could have would have should have the Falcons if they finish out that drive it is the drive that could have would have should have beaten the Washington Commanders just in my opinion and what's really crazy too is I was looking back at the second half just in general after a first half that I thought the Falcons were even though they only scored 10 points going into halftime it was a very balanced offensive attack. You had, I think, 100 rushing yards and 104 passing yards. I didn't have any, any issue with what we saw from the Falcons offensively in the first half. And then they come out in the second half, and they only had 13 plays before that 11-play final drive. And that's really tough when you have a commander's team that had – two very long physical productive drives that ended up scoring 10 points for them over a span of like 13 and a half minutes. So that juxtaposition of what the Falcons were doing in the third and beginning of the fourth quarter versus what the commanders were doing, that was kind of the crux of the situation that the Falcons got themselves in. But again, Scott, going back to what you're saying, the defense did give them a shot at the end. And that's kind of all you could ask for when you get to that point. You, and Arthur Smith even said, we knew it was going to be a low scoring game. So because of that, every single time the offense has the ball, it's important and you have to find ways to score points. And so going three and out in two of their four possessions in the third and fourth quarter, I thought was that was the part that I kept sticking on. We can talk about the the end of the drive and the interception, but I kind of agree with what Arthur Smith and Marcus Mariota and Tyler Algier were saying, where it was like, you know, the play call was there. The look was there. It was just the a defensive lineman made a play at, on a last ditch effort, throwing his hands up and getting his, his hand on the ball. And I, I'm, I think like that, whole situation we could probably talk for 45 minutes about that play and that play call and what that moment was but to me it was like it was the third and fourth quarter all together and it wasn't executing at the way that they needed to and again going back to they had every opportunity to win this game in multiple different ways and didn't do it and I, I think Marcus Mariota is taking a lot of heat for that final interception I I actually don't have a problem with the way that Marcus played on Sunday. Did he make a few decisions that I kind of was very, very questionable? Absolutely. But 
at the end of the day, it was, they did, they were in the position to win the game and they didn't do it. And I don't know, I could keep talking, but I'm just going to stop talking because I'm getting myself frustrated. <laughs> All right. Well, I have to offer a rebuttal. Um, we Go ahead. Have most things, I think we're going to disagree on this. The, the, the previous three and outs, I think are important in the context of the game and their inability to maintain a consistent productive offense is an issue but when it comes down to it with so many of these games we talk about coming down to the final drive where the falcons had an opportunity on the final drive at the two yard line and then the four and then they had three opportunities to cash in and they didn't and i kind of i don't want to say well that's just bad luck a guy got his hand on the ball right mm -hmm. at some point you've got to execute down there right? You yeah. just do. And in those two plays after the offside set them up with, I believe a first down and Arthur Smith was, wasn't terribly specific about whether Marcus Mariota made the right read on the run where he lost two yards. And I know that we are going to get nitpicky in and we're not going to go 45 minutes. I've already promised that we wouldn't even go 30, <laughs> but nonetheless, when it comes down to those key moments, are you going to execute or are you not? Okay. Yeah. And they had the opportunity there because it's a team effort three and out. All right. That's not good for the offense, but the defense got you two key stops. They got a three and out and they somehow got you the ball again with 30 seconds left, but there was a penalty that negated that opportunity. But I look at those moments as determining factors about th that you want to look back in January or whenever you're done playing with as few regrets as possible. Mm-hmm. That's going to, that, in my opinion, ranks right up there with the Jalen Ramsey interception with the Kyle Pitt splitting the safety against the Chargers. That play, whether it was the right call or not, I'm not saying that you're wrong. Right. I think maybe I, fans are going to say, my mailbag is, is already full of why didn't they run over pass, right? Same right. with the old Seahawks argument. Why didn't they run it over pass, right? I don't really like those arguments very much. Um, but I do understand with the fact that when you're in that moment, you, you got a hit or when you're sitting on the outside, looking in, you can look back at three or four plays and be like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I get it. Right. Yeah. I get it. We didn't show up in those three or four moments. Those three or four moments can be offense or defense or special teams that each one has played a part this season, but they weathered all the, they weathered all of that. And they had that moment. They were on the two. Yeah. Sit here with an L considering what happened to Tampa um, is definitely is, is definitely, I think will be a tough thing for the Falcons to look back on this season if they don't succeed and be like, Oh, shoulda, coulda, woulda, just like mm -hmm. what you said. And I think yeah. that drive is a real shoulda, coulda, woulda moment here. Um, you know, again, we don't want to belabor that final play to death. It is what it is. Chris Lindstrom did his job blocked his man to the point yeah. Deron Payne had nothing else to do with, but put a hand up. Mm -hmm. Ultimately that's not the situation that you want leading up to it though. There uh, Washington has two key drives here. Uh, the Falcons had how many turnovers, Tori one, the Michael Walker pick. Yeah. Okay. Only one. Uh, Tori posed this question just generally defensively. Ashton, what did you think of their defensive effort? You played some edge rusher in your high school days. Uh, yeah. What did you make of that um, defensive effort, um, especially on those Washington drives? And then also with the fact that even though they gave up long and sustained scoring drives, they were able to tighten up when it mattered most. Yeah, for sure. I think um, I think the secondary played better today. I'm not going to say they played really good, but um, I think the secondary played better. Um, I think Washington, I mean, our, our run defense wasn't tight at all today. You know, Robinson, he had a lot of big plays. I think he had like multiple 10 yard plus runs against the Falcons today. And I think that's what hurt him most. Um, I know the weather was pretty bad out there. It was rainy, it was cold. Um, but that's still no excuse, um, especially if Washington is executing. Um, I, I just think we have to do better up front and a bit, I mean, I know Taquan Graham, he's out right now. So that's a, that's a big piece to the defense and to that yeah. front interior line. But again, they have to do better up front. It definitely starts up front. And um, I, I think the way Washington was running the ball, they were, they was breaking down the defense, you know, the offense, like Tori mentioned, it was so many three and outs that the defense was on the field for so long. And I think that was that, you know, kind of wore them down. They were tired. 
Um, and then especially when Washington just kept running the ball, pounding the ball down their throat, that just made it even worse. So um, I think what hurt them most was definitely the run defense and, and starting up front, for sure. Tori, how do you think the Falcons did without Kyle Pitts? Uh, I thought they did okay. Uh, I thought it was interesting that they included um, Cordero Patterson a little bit more in the run or in the run game in the pass game than they have previously. I think that's something that they should honestly, I'd like to see them utilize a little bit more. Um, and I've said that all year. This isn't just because Kyle Pitts isn't on the field. I've, I've said that I'd like to see Cordero Patterson in the pass game a little bit more anyways. Um, I, I, also thought, and I know Ashton wrote about this after the game, I thought Alameda Zacchaeus had a really good day. It's interesting, too, how I think Michael Pruitt continues to do things that I really like, and I'm not just talking about the touchdown that they scored on that drive in the, the, to start the second quarter. Um, I think he continues to to impress me and in, in what he's been able to do. Um, and the thing is, I mean, and it goes back to, I think st- something that Marcus has said, it's something that Arthur Smith has said, like you don't replicate Kyle Pitts with one person, you replicate him with a collection of people. And I thought that the Falcons had a lot of really interesting formations and preset motions. And I thought they were doing some things offensively that we haven't necessarily seen them do um well I say you haven't seen them do we have seen them do it it's just kind of it just felt a little different but again you do miss Kyle Pitt's presence and Arthur Smith was asked after the game if Washington maybe played them differently without Kyle Pitts on the field and he said kind of no um which I thought was really interesting because mm-hmm. I feel like defenses if I'm a defensive coordinator I know where Kyle Pitts is on the field at all times and I'm essentially I mean, the threat of him alone, I, I feel like takes up a, a, a good portion of your mind. Um, so that was kind of surprising to me. And so all in all, I think I think it was fine. I don't think it was great because um, obviously they didn't win. So it's like, OK, you can't be great if they didn't win. Um, and so, yeah, it's just kind of like meh to me. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. It, it, I didn't think it was mu- it was as much of a factor as I would have expected. Something else that's already filled the mailbag, in addition to why didn't you run the ball uh, down by the goal line, is why isn't Drake London seeing more targets? That's a common refrain. I think it was amplified because there are no, uh, you know, that that Kyle Pitts isn't on the field anymore. Right. Or and just like you said, we haven't really seen it all year about. Cordero Patterson, a career receiver lining up in traditional receiver positions that he's mm-hmm. often, he's often coming out of the backfield, which, you know, is just an interesting development. He's been effective there. Right. And they were effective running the ball and they were effective doing the things that, that like they ultimately like to do. But when you look at this and now we'll head over to the, to the, uh, to the column that I wrote is that I went in to that post-game press conference and into the open locker room where I do most of my work, to be honest with you. Um, I, I went into that thinking I'm going to write a story about, I don't want to hear the word playoffs anymore until they can put at least two wins together before they can do what is required to actually win a division. And then, and I didn't notice this credit where credits due. Josh Kendall of the athletic did. There was a group of Falcons all huddled around Cornell Armstrong's phone while they were watching Tampa Bay blow it to a three-win uh, Cleveland Browns team. And ultimately, as Ashton pointed out, there's no 500 team here. As Tori put out in her notes, and I'm going to try to pronounce this as it's spelled, Tampa Bay lost. What? <laughs> W-U-T. W-U-T, which sort of felt like it. That did not seem like an, an expected result. I keep sort of thinking that a team with Tom Brady and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and Vitavea and on and on and on is going to turn the switch. Right. And then it keeps kind of not happening. I don't watch every snap of them. Somebody who does can probably tell me exactly why, but the bottom line from a Falcons perspective is okay. Let me just ask the question as opposed to saying it. And (laughs) I don't care who answers, but does what happened against in or with Tampa and Cleveland, does it change how you view this loss 
or does the loss still sting and is it still hurtful or is it somehow mitigated or is it somehow worse? Let's take a poll. I think you have to not think about it in the way of like having other people decide how you move forward. Like I wouldn't, I think about the whole, like, you know, you decide your own destiny and you choose where you go and how you do it. Like have ownership of what you are doing. Don't, don't get in, don't like move forward in the way that you think about something simply because another factor changed kind of the the surrounding landscape of it so to me like it doesn't change this loss like I guess in the grand scheme of the NFC South like yeah sure but I think I said a couple weeks ago that the Falcons needed to win out to the bye week and they didn't and so I to me it does change how the Falcons move forward because it, but it doesn't change it in the scope of the NFC South to me. It changes where the Falcons are. They have to put more wins together for themselves, not for the NFC South, not for anything else, for themselves to put better product out on the field. And that's kind of where I I land in that. Like, sure, you can say, of course, and there are going to be a lot of people that say, oh, like this loss is fine because Tampa lost. But I don't think you have, I don't think you think about it that way if you're the players or the coaches. Like you should be really mad that you lost this game, that yeah. you weren't able to execute and in the moments when it mattered most. That should f- f- fuel you, not what Tampa Bay did, in my opinion. Ashton, thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Tori said it. Um, and I think Marcus Mariota said it in his post game presser paraphrasing him he said you can't let nobody control your destiny um and I and I think just because Tampa Bay lost I don't think the Falcons like Tori said the Falcons shouldn't be happy about that um they needed this win today they needed they need the win against Pittsburgh against Baltimore against New Orleans Tampa and Arizona moving forward um you know especially if they want to get into the playoffs but I don't think they should look at the Tampa loss as as a good sign because they're they're still not playing at the level that they should be playing. They have to stack wins. They have to be consistent um, on both sides of the ball. I, I just think you know it, it's it's a team. I think it's a team effort. I'm not even going to focus on one player. It's a, it's a team effort as a collective. And I think um, you know the Falcons. They they truly have to hone in on their mistakes. They have to capitalize on you know on I was on their mistakes on other teams mistakes um and, and they just have to be better moving forward like these last five games are crucial um and they and they truly have to just lock all the way in in my opinion the Falcons have won two games in a row one time weeks three and four that's it they've lost a couple in a row since they've not put together the the type of run that is going to loft them to a place where they can really win a division title. As Ashton pointed out earlier, they still have games against the saints and the bucks. Those are important. And frankly, in this league, Tori's point, which was made back in April or maybe the previous April, I can't remember. (laughs) It's always still the same. Uh, It matters more about when you play a team than who you play at times. Go ask Baltimore, how it was playing Jacksonville today. Didn't work out very well for them. Ultimately, it's a, not even about what you're sub, what you should do or what you what it looks like on paper. It's about how you execute on that particular day. And I think too often when the opportunities have been presented to the Atlanta Falcons, I do think they are playing. Last year they were seven and two in one score games, but it was either you're winning a, a one score game or you're getting blown out. Yeah, That was how it worked last year. That's not how it works. That's not how it has worked this year because the Falcons have been most often with rare exception competitive. I would yeah. anticipate some of these games over the last five, the Falcons being competitive and in it. But when you're on the two and you, <laughs> you have to punch six, it in, <laughs> got to punch it in. And you have four chances to do it because it was first and goal from the two. Yeah. First and goal from the two. They didn't even get to use all of their lifelines. Ultimately, I think, I think, and that's why y'all's answers were, I've been in the South too long. You all eh. had good answers. No, 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 no. Y'all, y'all. Y'all. <laughs> uh, it's that, that that's why they're sitting where they are. 
I think the Tampa Bay influence of it all is that they're still in it because Tampa Bay could be, I'm not, could be, I'm not trying to say what they should win or lose, but in a normal division, you would have at least one team that's well over 500 and the Falcons would sort of be out of it, but they're still in it through some good luck and some grace. And the only way that any of that matters is if they perform better in the clutch and to Tory's point more consistently over the course of four quarters. Are we going to get and like if, a And if game? they win, just win. Yeah, like just that, win. Like, just win. Like, break over that. Like, just step mm-hmm. over the line. They're toeing right. the line. Just step over it. Right. I feel like that's better. And I wish people could see it because Tori has, has her... Uh, her Apple wired headphones in and she just <laughs> lifted the microphone up directly in front of her voice. So everyone could hear that last part. And I think that's a great way to end it. The inside is fantastic. It doesn't matter how you get there, how pretty or ugly it is. Get across the line. Yeah. That's our new theme. Get across the line. Uh, they were a couple yards away and couldn't do it against Washington. Can they do it against Pittsburgh? We will be there to break it all down after that Steelers game at Mercedes Benz stadium, where the Falcons have played pretty darn well to the tune of four wins to this point at home. They're going to need another home crowd. I'm sure there will be some Steelers fans. It should be a raucous atmosphere. Red helmets are coming back. What? (laughs) Red helmets are coming back. And red helmets are coming back. All of the exciting things together at once. It should be a lot of fun. I think Ashton's family's coming to this one too. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Edmonds clan yeah, is going to be there. All my family from Pittsburgh is coming, so I'm excited. Yeah. So, but they're going to be wearing Falcons gear, right? Right, Ashton? There's only one answer. I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless. My mom, uh, my mom is. My mom. Is. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, thank you all so much for downloading, listening, and please subscribe to the Falcons Podcast Network, your one-stop shopping for all things audio awesomeness around, about the Atlanta Falcons. I think I'm done. I'm out of oxygen. It's super <laughs> late on a Sunday. We made it in less than 30 minutes. Woohoo! Woo! Round of applause. mandate was achieved. <laughs> Talk to y'all next week. <laughs> <laughs>